I'd like to welcome everyone. My name is Sherwood Smith. I'm Senior Executive Director for Diversity Engagement and Professional Development. And we're sponsoring this talk by Professor Edward Dunbar from UCLA. By practice, he's a clinical psychologist at UCLA. And I had the pleasure of meeting him at the Summer Institute for Intercultural Communication, where he also teaches. And many years ago, he was here for something called Psychology Challenges Biased Behavior. He is an author, and we'll tell you a little bit about his books, but his, one of his most recent books is The Psychology of Hate Crimes as Domestic Terrorism. And he was given the 2001 award by the American Psychological Association for professional service contributions to the community. He's worked with the UCLA Police Department, Unified School District in UCLA, and has done a lot of detailed research, which you'll have the benefit of tonight to understand sort of the motivations and also, to some extent, effective responses. So without further ado, Ed, thank you so much you. for joining us. Hey there. Hi. Can you all hear me? Yeah? Wonderful. OK, great. So um, thank you for having me here. Um, what Sherwood didn't say is that I used to teach second grade in the White Mountains of New Hampshire years ago. Uh, though I'm not originally a New Englander, but so I appreciate this part of the country and love to come back here, be here. Uh, a little bit about what I'd like to talk, talk with you about and kind of go through is to give you a working definition of really what a hate crime is. I know it's a term that we've all heard, but to kind of look at it up close and personal, spend a little bit of time talking about the people that um, we see who have perpetrated forms of hate crimes, domestic terrorism in this country. Um, Talk about something kind of interesting, which is actually a book I've got coming out in about a month now on looking at the interrelationship between hate violence in the United States and the 2016 presidential election. And really then talk a little bit about some of the fallout for how our society right now is dealing with the issue of, to use an old term, intergroup relationships or intergroup conflict in the aftermath of the election and the things that we've seen that have been happening. So to kind of put it another way, by my background, I've worked inside the Los Angeles Police Department, the criminal conspiracy unit, where I basically walked through the front door and said, I've been doing research in hate crimes for about the last 15 years. I like to come in and work in your crime lab and bring my psychology students with me and uh, have access to work with you. And interestingly, they were open to that and allowed me to spend the better part of five, six years working as part of their investigative unit. So some of the things I'm going to talk about come right out of the data of our working with the police officers, the responding to hate crimes, and then analyzing the crime reports and following up with the criminal histories of these offenders. As a clinician, I've worked with people who have been hate organizers. I work with people that are mandated for perpetrating hate crimes in Los Angeles. I've had students of mine who have been um, gay bashed. I've had uh, patients I've worked with who I've treated who were the victims of violent forms of hate activity, hate uh, offenses, hate assaults. Um, and I've spent a fair amount of time working in um, some of the courtroom situations having to do with people that have perpetrated homicides harassed individuals and also then the claimants who've brought charges against institutions where they have been the targets of hate crimes and hate incidents. So to me this is not some abstract, far removed idea. It's not like I'm looking at uh, Department of Justice statistics, but rather people that I see maybe sometimes you know, on a weekly basis, even more than weekly basis, maybe over the course of several years. So I'll talk a little bit at the sort of more immediate level of what this kind of looks like up close and personal. So all that being said, and I'll give you two quick illustrations of what we're looking at here. Um, this is an example of a statute, California State. And I would point out to you, if you come down through here to about the fourth line, the idea about uh, motivation being either in whole or in part, italics mine, um, by the po hostility to the real or perceived ethnic background, national origin, religious beliefs, sex, age, disability, sexual orientation, so, you know, this is very psychologically laden because we're introducing the idea of motivation as if we can understand the motivation of a person who does hate violence and also enter into the idea of, of trying to understand how they perceive really us. And the conception of the idea of difference is something that then leads people to engage in forms of, 
fear and intimidation, with the intention of causing fear and intimidation. So some of you probably know this because if you're here at five o'clock the afternoon after a long day, you know, clearly your motivations are, are you know, special and unique or important, frankly, to me. Um, this is not a crime, and these are not crimes perpetrated against individuals. They're crimes that are perpetrated against communities and also perpetrated against classes of individuals. And the motivation is really not just the individual that is targeted, it is to send the message in most of these cases to anyone of that population. Vermont's law, a little bit truncated here, but again, bias motivated violence. And you know, by the way, the word hate is something I want to look at a little bit into this with you to say, hate, is it hate? or is it bias? And they are really, you know, in some ways, quite different things. Um, and again, intimidation, where there could be a civil action, meaning that there's the opportunity for a civil remedy to this problem, as well as criminal pen penalties to this problem. And then we again see the kind of typical classes that have been promulgated here, race, religion, ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender, and other, other including physical, mental disabilities. So kind of as a, as a, as a primer um, to you is I'd like to kind of deal with some of the resistance you may find if you walk out of here today and you talk to people about, I'm trying to understand what this thing called a hate crime is. It's something that occurs in our country. It's something which has been identified since about 1992 with the passage of a federal act asking for state law enforcement agencies to report hate violence. So what is this thing, and what is it we're looking at, and what do we see in the way of resistance to this, to this class of legislation and laws? Well, for one, is to say that it is not a crime against a person, but it's again, as I said, it's a crime against a community. Two, that a hate crime, I'd like to argue today, is not a matter of getting into somebody's internal mental apparatus, it's rather what they do in the public arena, in the public sphere. And as such, a hate crime is not identity politics gone amok. It's rather that there has to be a primary offense to begin with. In other words, there's a generic offense in any hate crime. Put simply, targeting a mosque and defacing it is called property crime. The question then becomes, is there also additionally what we call an enhancement offense, which has to do with saying this was also bias motivated. Robbery is a crime which when there's also the presence that I'm robbing, as I've known people, I've talked to people who will say, I rob gay men because they won't go to the police because the police are just as likely to be violent as I am. So therefore, I go pick a victim who's not likely to report the crime. So the Infraction has to first be found in the penal code, we call the enhancement, which in Vermont, California, any state law would then say, in addition, there is this other offense which we treat as being serious enough that we will then arrest the individual and potentially prosecute them for perpetrating a bias-motivated crime. So I want to emphasize when people say, you know, here, here we go, all crimes are hate crimes. Now, I've worked in a youth prison in, in New York City in the past. I have honestly must have evaluated at least 2,000 people who have been released from California State penitentiaries. I used to work with kids who belonged to the Mexican Mafia in a, in a day program. Um, the vast majority of violent offenders that I've evaluated, that I've worked with, that I've seen, would say they have no animus whatsoever towards their victims. It's for them a lifestyle and it's a form of self-support. It's an economic alternative to working, if you will, in a fast food restaurant. So animus or hostility may be really very absent. And you know, it's kind of intriguing, a term I may not use again today, the clinical psychopath, you know, they may be very under aroused, right? Physiologically, people are extremely dangerous and violent. In some cases, right before they do the crime, their heart rate drops, their pulse drops. They become focused. We'll talk about that a little bit. So 
all crimes are not crimes of hate. In fact, the majority, again, of career criminals are doing this where for them it's like their day in the office. So hate crimes are crimes that, as I'd also suggest, have a cultural meaning to all of us, that we, we understand the offense because it, 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 it resonates to things about the dynamics of our history, of our culture, of our community, of the relationships we hold, and it, hence as such, we know that these are crimes that hate makes some sense, or bias, if you will, makes some sense. And maybe we could do a little quick thought experiment. Why don't we take the first case? So if everybody could be so good as to get a case study here, and just take a moment silently to read it, and then I'll tell you a little bit about the case, and just to kind of hammer out some of the issues here about what bias may look like in a specific instance. So while this is coming around, let me just kind of add about this. Um, UCLA schools, universities in Texas, Hawaii, Oregon, I've done research on students' experience of bias. And you know what? A lot of these are what we would call a hate incident, meaning they are as I used in my title, kind of like bad manners or hate speech. So consider, you could walk across the street onto a public sidewalk and use pretty much any kind of language of hatred. And in the United States, it's protected under the First Amendment. So here we get into culture. In the United States, we'll say that that's a right of free speech. Now. If you walk into the classroom, or if you walk into the workplace, you have probably violated an institutional code that is either state, institution-based, and or federal. So like, for example, if there's federal education money, we will say you cannot have a hostile learning environment, just like you cannot have a hostile work environment. And those may be treated not as criminal, but rather as infractions that the person will be dealt with, hopefully and that the target will be supported, hopefully. But those are not crimes. Those are you know, bad manners plus plus, if you will. So in many of the things that may occur at a campus will fall short of being criminal. But I would argue from the work I've done over 15 years with the experience of university students, they can be just as emotionally harmful as an assault with a deadly weapon. And in some ways, can actually be worse because, as strange as it sounds, the assault usually occurs once. The students I've seen who have been harassed may have that go on for two or three years of their academic life. People in the workplace may experience this as something that occurs over the course of several months. And it's not just what does the institution or the victim do, but it's also what does the institution do to respond to it. So the, the case is out, is that correct? Yeah. Take about two, three minutes and just read this silently. Then I'll just talk about the case to you. And my question for you is, is this a hate crime? Go ahead and just take a look at the case. I'll say this as you're reading, you know, if you work in the behavioral sciences, if you work in community, if you work in criminal justice, maybe even sometimes community relations, social policy, if you work in student life, 
your job, you get some strange phone calls. Okay, you get some strange phone calls. Uh, this person called me up cross country, the, the the victim, and said, you know, what what is what is this all about? So. What do we have here? Again, let's come back to sort of like, you know, basic terms. Um, we have property crime, right? It's graffiti. Imagine if it's your house, right? So there has been some kind of symbol placed on your property uh, without your permission, which also holds a cultural meaning. So elements that are present, granted minor property damage, in other words, this would be under like $500 probably to repair, but would still qualify as a form of property crime. It would also then qualify potentially, if we understand the meaning of a swastika, right, as a symbol. So what did this individual do? Number one, they contacted their local synagogue. The comment with the rabbi was, We've heard this from other people not too far from your house. So the messaging was kind of both ways. One, this is not just you. Two, something's going on here, and we're not so sure why. What the individual said to me was kind of interesting. He said, you know, I've lived in this house for several, several years. I'm moving out, and now this happens? You know, and while it might seem unimportant, it was really also very baffling to the individual. And became part of the question. So it was investigated by police, the New Jersey, which is where this occurred, Human Relations Commission got involved, again, the synagogue was involved. With me so far? So it sounds like a hate crime. It's not a violent hate crime, but it's symbolic. It sends a message. It's relevant to his culture, to our traditions. And then something interesting happened was they talked to the family that was purchasing the house. And Sherwood, you were talking about being in, I think you said, Inner Mongolia. OK. And in Inner Mongolia, you saw a temple. And the temple has the swastika. This family similarly came from a religious sect where the swastika was something that was put on the house by one of the kids as a symbol of protection to the house. So in other words, to sound like a statistician, the false positive, this was indeed not a hate crime at all. It was rather something that was done by the family that had already you know, gone into escrow, so forth and so on, the house, but had never communicated that to the current owner. So this can get complicated right away. And the complexity leads some people to wonder if these hate crimes should really exist. You know, I was saying to some people earlier today, I know of two cases where university faculty in the last 20 years have faked a hate crime on their campus. And in some cases, to kind of try and redirect from things they were doing that got them in trouble, ultimately. So, you know, we do have an occasion, these false positives, either willful or accidental. I personally have never worked a case like that, and I've probably evaluated something like about 3,500 hate crimes in Los Angeles, as well as other things, particularly Florida, where I work with people who do homicides. I have not seen that, but I know it's out there. Um, now, let's come back to first orders of business. Who does these crimes? And if you look up here, this was just a sort of a day in the life. Basically here, one year I just pulled out randomly of the several years that I've gathered uh, crime data on in Los Angeles, and I just said, okay, let's look at LA, where in one calendar year they had 237,000, roughly 238,000 if you want to round it up, total reported infractions. And when you look at this very, very small, literally about one third of 1% of the crimes that were identified as hate crimes, something kind of interesting to kind of violate some of our stereotypes. These are crimes that were substantially more likely to be perpetrated by adult men, substantially less likely to be perpetrated by adult women. But contrary to a lot of our, our stereotypes of hate crime offenders, are no more likely to be perpetrated by adolescents and teenagers at all. So if you think of this being the, 
18-year-old, 17-year-old neo-Nazi, think again. In fact, the arithmetic average age of the adult uh, suspect we see in Los Angeles runs around 30. So they're not talking 22. We're talking people that have been out and in their life, arguably, for at least the better part of a decade. Importantly, too, when you look at the kind of offenses, if you look here in this first, crimes against the person being a violent offense is that hate crimes on the average in the long run tend to be substantially more violent than most infractions you say in a community. In this case, about three and a half fold more so. Okay, so we can talk about symbolic crimes and indeed I would say any real hate crime is symbolic. But when you look at really what's happening, they are more violent. And in Los Angeles, I'm not going to say this generalizes to the entire country, but Los Angeles, I can say with confidence, over 20 years, who are the most violent crimes targeting are two populations, gay and lesbian targets and African-American men. Secondly, and this won't show here, so I'll say a third thing. Secondly, these are much less likely to have to do with money. So now we get into the head of the offender where it's half again as likely that these have any material pursuit, meaning carjacking, robbery, burglary. The hate offender in many cases, interestingly, will perpetrate their offense where literally they leave the victim with their money. So. You know, we, again, you know, even when I've talked with a lot of career criminals, and you know, guess what? Career criminals also get on the internet, so there have been times I've evaluated people, and they go, oh, I've read all your research, which is a little chilling, you know, like you got some guy out there. As I said to Sherwood, you know, I've evaluated stalkers, and they'll send me Christmas cards, you know, like, hi, just checking in with you. It's like, we know where you are, we know what you're doing. So these guys read this stuff, you know? Is there only people to read my research, or probably people are locked up, you have a lot of time on your hand if you're, if you're in the penitentiary. Um, and they got to access the internet. Um, you know, they say, this is a stupid crime. You know, hey, doc, why do these people do this? They're not even going for the money. I say, so clearly something else is going on here. Okay. The thing that's not reflected here, but you'll see it maybe a little bit elsewhere, is these are almost always crimes where you don't know your victim. So if we think of hate, you think of passion, right? So a lot of homicide cases that I've, I've been involved in work with people on over the years, they're crimes of passion where you're acting out against somebody that you have a prior relationship with, okay? That's exactly the contrary here. You are finding people you don't know. You do not know. And it's a culture that people who are truly the hostile, violent, bias-identified individuals enter into. So one of my colleagues with LAPD shared with this with me, and um, this is hard to know to see, but here's the thing that's intriguing. In California, there are about 50, actually more, 50 specific tattoo icons that if you are part of the lifestyle, you will look at something, maybe the image of the woman or of the skull and the centerpiece that will say, I'm a member of something like we call the Peckerwood Gang or Aryan Nation or the Sotel Gang. And they are, they're communicating, they're communicating then the imagery that will be found that we, we won't know what that's about. And that when these are darkened in, it's a symbol to say, one, I am a member of the gang. Two, as they're darkened in, I have, I have done more violent offenses. So when you see somebody that not only has the symbol, but it's darkened in, it's to say, well, I've probably done a homicide. So, you know, they live in their own world of communicating this idea of violence that we, on the outside, the normies, just kind of sort of get. Um, now, 
I'll tr go through this pretty quickly because I want to be sure we have time to kind of look at some of the other questions here. Um, it's not getting in someone's head. It's not mind reading. Um, articulated hate ideology. These offenders will tell you they have an ideological motivation. They will associate with other people, just like in the, the image I just showed you, members of gangs, members of groups. Some of these people even work and do crimes repeatedly, hate crimes in pairs, okay? Um, the weakest of these, I personally believe, is the idea of hate speech during the commission of the offense. In other words, the presence of hate language is often found, but in and of itself, I think of as kind of weak. The use of hate symbols, and then, you know, simply this, prior behavior predicting future behavior. Yeah, we have repeat hate crime offenders. These are not that hard to see, literally, and hard to um, identify, and, you know, kind of gets into the idea of who and what are these people. And in the course of just the work I've done, and again, going through these crime reports year to year, and following up and looking at the criminal histories of hate crime offenders, it's had me kind of do a little bit more of a breakout of like, well, what are these things called the motivation? What are the things we should be worried about? And I'll talk about these in a second, but let me step back and say, if I'm at a university, I'll tell you what you would be concerned about is one, any kind of repeat activity by an individual that shows some bias or prejudice that is activated the student who's been called in again for some kind of taunting of an international student, where it has recurred, or number two, where it diversifies. So it was last year I was harassing a woman on a soccer team, and this year I'm harassing a Taiwanese student. That's where I would say the light should be going off because it's saying to you there is a course of activation that makes that person more problematic. Okay, and my argument for being in a school university environment is hate incidents, which are not per se crimes, are going to predict ultimately the risk of a hate crime occurring. Okay, so. I wouldn't want you to think, well, what if we don't have people carrying weapons and shooting at each other and stabbing each other in campus? I'd say, oh, well, I hope not, because that's not what you're here for. But additionally, think of it this way. You are looking at young adults who, in some cases, are going to act out in disinhibited ways because of the use of alcohol, controlled substances on one hand, and then on the other hand, are at a very ripe age for, and if any of you do like mental health work, initial psychiatric breaks, right? So guess what? In my clinical work, people who are more likely to show hostility towards racial differences often show things such as alcohol abuse, hyperactivity, bipolar disorder. These are people that are impulse disturbed, and it's a warning sign. Now, if it escalates, you see the things I've talked about, including some of the idea of targeting people based upon sexual orientation or gender bending. And also, interesting idea, and again, I think this has some play here, probably in more rural communities, not just urban environments, is the idea of protecting your community. And Donald Green, a poli-sci person now at Columbia, has talked about this idea of when you look at racialized gangs, you will see that they try to keep their community free of what they see as competing racial groups that could come in. Now, that's an urban phenomenon, may, maybe. And many of those kids will say, you know, we don't hate this family, but we're going to arson their house because if they get to stay, then the kids will follow, and now we're competing for the same drug trade. Very common theme you'll see with gangs. What I could expect here, you could see people probably driving from rural parts of the state, frankly, to Burlington, to target non-US or non-Vermonters as a way of driving folks out. In Los Angeles, what do we see? Somebody will drive for maybe 75 to 90 minutes to go find a target of someone that they've never met before. And the real point I'd like to make is really this, is 
it's kind of like your house cat, okay? There is uh, sort of differences of kinds of aggression. So the cat over here is like eyes are focused, ears are back, body's in control, looking at its target. Over here, this is the kind of hyper-aroused, out-of-control, aggressive response. The hate crime offender usually shows this kind of premeditation planning. And to put it another way, why you will then drive or go out of your own community. And when people are more bias motivated, they go further from where they live and they become more violent in the course of committing the crime against somebody that they've never met before. So again, a lot of our ideas of you're doing this for money, this is a crime of passion, it's about a relationship that's gone wrong, is just not supported when you really look closely at the people who are doing the crimes in our communities. Now, I'll go through this kind of quickly, but if I were to really kind of try and think about this more so, I'd say we've got people that are hate aroused, and then people that have sort of like an expression of some kind of a hate ideology, right? And if you kind of think of the balance of these two things, it at least gives me a way to kind of think about some of the motivational differences. And I'll go through this quickly because then we get on to some other issues. You know, for one, we've got some people, label is a fancy word, the highly emotional bigot, the person who is highly arousable and may have a very absent sense of any real ideology or motivation. These are just the explosive personalities when we see at large. But in this case, what they are targeted by is any one of a group that they feel then is going to disinhibit them. I'll jump over these guys for a moment. The hate extremist is the person who is both highly ideologically motivated and highly arousable. Um, these are the people that you would expect to be like really particularly dangerous. But then we also consider these folks to be ex extremely dangerous, which is, again, like our, like our house cat, low arousal, very low stress response, high intention and ideology. Now, you know what? Interestingly, we also have people, the biased follower, who really aren't particularly anything except that this is their social group that they belong to. And as I was saying to Sherwood earlier, Years ago, I had the opportunity, if you want to call it that, to talk to some people who had participated in lynching activity in this country. And it was interesting to hear the commentary of like it was like going to a football rally. So that for them, they just kind of, they went along. And you will see people that just kind of got along and went along in doing something that maybe they knew was really kind of a bad idea. So. Hate behavior, explosive personality, the bigot, the extremist, ideologically driven, will engage in both reactive, meaning sort of spontaneous, as well as symbolic violence. The planful terrorist, now if you think of this as domestic terrorism, this is kind of like the McVeigh characters who blow up the buildings. You know, they have an ideological plan, but they're very systematic and organized. And then we have the folks down here, okay? Um, if you want to read a really compelling book on this sort of issue, I would recommend a book called The Racist Mind by Raphael Ezekiel. And Rafe wrote a book, and it's, it's without statistics, and it's not about research. It's rather Rafe's accounting of what he, over the course of several years, found by going to members of the Ku Klux Klan in the South and neo-Nazi groups in the Midwest to say, hi, I'm a Jew, psychologist, liberal, University of Michigan, Ann Arbor-based psychologist, and I'm really interested to hear what's going on in your head. And he talked about the frequent bias follower, the people that just simply went along because they didn't have any other identity to be a part of. Okay? And when I use this idea, you know, some things kind of shake out a little bit. So when I looked at actually what the crimes that people committed were, the bigots, the people that kind of were both you know, low or high on arousal and ideology, indeed did very unplanned hate crimes, um, were more likely to do the crimes near to their home. The followers are more likely to do the graffiti and vandalism crimes, the non sort of in your face crimes, which again make them kind of unusual. 
we're more likely to do basically anti-Semitic crimes, which in many, many cases are simply, again, graffiti crimes. We're also less likely to, to actually get into physical aggression against the person. By comparison, the hate extremists were more likely to do crimes, assault with a deadly weapon, physical assaults, were more likely to threaten using language, and were more likely to go further away from their home community, in this case, like 25 plus miles, to commit the hate crime, and again, against people that they did not know. And then our sort of like low aroused, highly ideological, were more likely to do the anti-Semitic crimes, and more likely to do clearly goal-directed crimes. So, you know, we kind of look at some of these things and say, here are some of the patterns that we're dealing with. Now, another thing. Would you think that if hate activity is found in our society, and again, hate crimes have been around since 1992, okay, as a legal entity, as a construct, Anybody who's a student of history knows that hate, violence, intergroup violence goes back millennia. So we have a very recent effort to kind of codify and identify what this is. Wouldn't you kind of think that this has a likelihood to occur throughout different social and cultural regions, across time, and so forth? The question that I put to you, kind of if you see that as plausible, is shouldn't we see kind of the same kind of phenomena re reported by law enforcement, at least at this country, at a state level? And the point becomes kind of simple that, and I like to think of it in terms of, if you've never seen this, you should really look at it, Ken Burns's documentary from the 1990s on the Civil War. And at the, almost the very end of hours and hours of discussion of the Civil War, Burns turns to Columbia University professor Barbara Fields where she basically looks at the camera and says, the Civil War is still ongoing. The question is, who's going to win? You know, I'm paraphrasing. I would take that and say, when you look at how law enforcement reports hate crimes, the Civil War has continued to this day. Because if you ask a very simple question, if year after year, the likelihood of reporting a hate crime is considered in terms of the alignment of the states during the Civil War, you'll see a substantial difference, almost a three to one ratio difference of the Union versus the Confederate States with the unaligned states falling sort of in the middle range. And so let's see, here we go. Um, here's the ratio for my state. Here's the ratio for your state. Here you're looking at the frequency of the states of the Union. Here you're looking at the ratio for the states of the South. And here you're looking at the unaligned states. I used to work in the Hawaii State Senate. I used to be a legislative analyst, OK? And we had a heck of a time, in fact, it never happened when I was working there, of getting a hate crime statute passed. And the prejudice in the state was, well, you're going to start picking up all these kids who are robbing tourists, and it's bad for business. And it took us, took people in the state government, a long time to get a state hate crime uh, statute passed. About 2002, somebody in Maine actually introduced a piece of legislation saying that motorcycle gang members should be a protected class under the hate crime law. So this gets kind of crazy sometimes. I'll be the first to admit it. Um, but we find that the sort of the war of the country has continued in how we talk about hate violence. And here, this is from the Southern Poverty Law Center, SPLC, of then also looking at the presence of hate groups. Okay, so again, as the number goes up, you're literally seeing a body count. You know, to be fair, California may have a larger population than let's say wherever it is here, Rhode Island, for example. But here is the Union. Here is the Confederacy. Here is the Union. Here is the Confederacy. Here is the Unaligned. So if you look at just who's reporting these crimes, we get into the question of saying, one, <laughs> 
There may be differences just because of the nature of how law enforcement at a state level views the legitimacy of these, of these laws. Now, okay, let's look at another kind of challenging issue here. So when you walk out of here today, if you wanted to talk to somebody about what we're dis discussing is hate crimes and domestic terrorism. Are these different things? So let's consider two relatively recent and notorious cases. So here we have Dylan Ruth, Charleston, goes into historic black church, interestingly spends several hours conversing with this elderly population before he opens fire and murders several of them. Saeed Farouk, who out maybe 50 miles from where I live, works in a state agency, uh, goes to a Christmas party, uh, two hours later comes back and uses semi-automatic weapons murders many of his co-workers. Planned and organized, radicalized by his father substantially. He hoped his attack would agitate race relations and awaken white Americans to the notion that they are second-class citizens. Inspired by terrorists organized and planned at least for a year, radicalization possible through internet, possibly through his wife didn't think Muslims should have to attend a non-Muslim event, didn't leave any kind of written documentation, at least that's been reported at this point. So again, this sort of like premeditated offense. Now, here we go. A guy we might have heard of named James Comey said that the San Bernardino case was, a, was one of domestic terrorism. Perpetrated by homegrown violent extremists. But when he was asked about Dylan Roof, he said, you know, I don't see it as a political act. I don't see it as a form of hate violence. Now, Roof was tried under the federal hate crime statute, thank goodness. But are these really, really different? Um, Loretta Lynch, DOJ, running DOJ at the time, says, of course that they are both forms of terrorism. Okay. So, you know, sometimes our laws get in the way of common sense, and sometimes our laws get in the way in which, oh, by the way, this is just kind of for fun. So here's one of these grand wizard guys in the Klan. Um, he was murdered by his own family. Must have been a really lovely guy. Um, are these different? Okay. Deaths and incidents. Al Qaeda. Right wing extremists. Okay. So you can see we're facing a lot of homegrown violence that is absent really any kind of international influence really of any sort whatsoever. So point of reference, two things that make our country kind of different around this issue to keep in mind. For one, our use of hate speech in a public arena is protected under the First Amendment at this point in time. If you were to go to many other industrialized countries, first world countries, that would be treated as a, an incitement to violence and you would be potentially prosecuted and incarcerated. So, I've worked with the European Union on these issues around hate crimes, and they say it's really interesting because we call these offenses that you call the rights to, to free speech. Number two, they don't have the term domestic terrorism. They say it's terrorism. So trying to kind of parse this out as a domestic and international, they just say, we don't even know why you're bothering to do that. Um, my comment back is, well, the thing that makes this all intriguing is if you were to look at the budgetary allocation to deal with hate crimes versus terrorism in this country, it is a dramatic difference of where our money goes. So our money is really directed towards terrorism, the low frequency infractions, whereas the high frequency infractions of hate crimes, we spend a lot more, less money on. Now, about three days after the election, my publisher said, hey, you want to write a book on hate crimes as they relate to what happened in the presidential election. I said, 
gives me something to do, I'll take a look at it. Um, I called it the cultural cataclysm in a wonderful uh, film documentary and Arthur Dong said, you want to talk about the losers. So this is basically, I'm going to talk about the experience of people that are supporting diversity, supporting a liberal democratic tradition, supporting the idea of free speech, and are advocates largely to things such as this whole notion of dealing with hate violence in our society. And I'd say what we're looking at minimally are three kind of challenge points of one that if you look at the election proper, we saw the infusion much more explicitly than we had before of hate rhetoric into political discourse. For number two, something which I don't know if I should say I'm gratified, but I'm seeing more and more being utilized is the no notion of the cultural wars argument, that the election was now a choosing of cultural traditions where there was then thirdly the idea of a winner-loser policy of governance. If you lost, you not just simply have lost, we are now in a place to challenge you. Now, here we get into some interesting things. I'm gonna go through this quickly and I'll try not to make this too complicated. Trump carried states versus Clinton carried states. Okay, reported hate crimes, twice as likely in the Clinton carried states versus the Trump carried states, somewhat less likely than the Trump states to have identified hate groups within the state. Now, these are the two interesting pieces for me. After the election, the likelihood of reported hate activity in the first month, this is the first month after the election, self-reported, was twice as likely in the Clinton-carried states as in the Trump-carried states. Now, this is a little bit like saying what I talked to you about with respect to the Civil War in some ways. The states that appeared to be more supportive of a traditional liberal democratic uh, process are states in which the citizenry said, I am much more likely to want to tell you that I've been the target of some kind of hate activity in the first month, meaning up until pretty much the middle of like Christmas time in 2016. So if I'm living in a community where I feel more likely to be listened to, I'm more likely to be telling. Now, who do they tell? They told the Southern Poverty Law Center that had a 24 seven internet live phone line documenting these incidents and they found this kind of a breakout. But I also like to come back to something that is really dramatic and terribly telling about like sort of a deep cultural issue in our country. And I kind of now will back into this on two different levels. And that is the idea of black lynching activity from 1880 to 1968. The Clinton states had on the average six reported over an 80 year period of documented lynchings that had occurred according to the Tuskegee Institute, which is the place that has documented, researched laboriously for years, violent homicidal lynching activity against blacks. The Trump states had on the average 110 cases. So let me put the idea of something that is going on 80, 90 years ago and its relationship to our current idea of democracy and of hate violence. This was also the one real predictor when I looked at things such as the presence of whites, the percentage of voting for Republican candidates, the change in economics over the last 15 years in this country. None of those predicted the underreportage of hate crimes state by state. It was rather the frequency of black lynching activity that occurred up until approximately 1970. This was also, again, a dramatic difference we found between the states that were carried by Trump versus Clinton. Which to me is kind of chilling and kind of really telling about some of what we are here about. Um, intriguingly, just to kind of give you something else to think about, what is happening is also to see economic disparity of changes in family median income and the long and the short of it is what these differences will show is that since about 2000 the Clinton states tended to show a greater level of economic vitality at the median family income level 
versus this Trump states, which showed a greater decline every five years, according to the census data, vis-a-vis -vis his comparison with the Clinton states. The Clinton states were more economically stable. The Trump states were showing greater economic decline. Again, the black lynchings, the underreportage of hate crimes, the overreportage of hate groups, and the substantially lower number of reported hate incidents. So we're kind of seeing this kind of a cleavage in just how then we viewed and approach the idea of the election. And if you look at the idea of like hate crimes and how they are related to what happened in the election, you could again see this more than twofold more likelihood of hate crimes being reported in the states that Clinton carried. And when we look at since the election, when we look at reported hate crimes, again, we see that the union states, I would argue here the places people feel more empowered, were more likely to report. Interestingly, here this flipped, Confederate versus non-aligned, and the non-aligned are really kind of a whole mix. Okay. So again, just like I kind of showed you before, you're seeing you know, the representation of reported hate incidents targeting the individual since the election. state by state. Now, so, I'm going to shift and just take a few minutes and talk about what I think is one of the bigger dilemmas that, again, I've been doing a series of um, surveys on SurveyMonkey and following up with people and also responding to some hate crime cases that was related to the election. So where the election now becomes a motivating factor for some people to per, uh, perpetrate forms of hate aggression against each other. This is my own personal example, which happened essentially about 6 o'clock in the morning the next day, where I was coming out of a yoga class, and a guy who used to work in a missile silo was saying how he couldn't vote for Hillary. And I said back, how could you as an ex-Air Force guy support somebody who thinks Vladimir Putin's a great guy? And his basic comment to me was, well, he thinks he's a great guy for Russia. You know, I'm thinking, man, here we go, here we go, okay? Um, so these are the, you know, the questions I could put to you if we were doing this more as really taking the time on it, you know. How has it impacted you in the relationships you have in our country, personally? How is it affecting your work going forward? You know, these are some of the questions I've been asking folks. And here we go. Um, Within one month, what were we seeing? We were seeing that people that were supportive of Clinton reported a lot more arguments with their coworkers. Um, really intriguing. You know, we're now living in an age where a, a good way to know about our relationships with people interculturally and in our relationships is how many people did you lose through Facebook out of the election? You know, and I have people coming in and saying, I'm not going back to Ohio anymore because, you know, and I'm getting rid of my brother off of my Facebook feed and, you know, hearing this kind of thing. Um, what did people associate? And again, these are, as Arthur Dong would put it, the losers. How did the losers look at this? The most primary reported association people had right after was to 9-11. And this is a sample of three. So about one third of people reported their primary association of the loss of Clinton was to the terrorist attack. Then also some to prior presidential. And then interestingly, about maybe a tenth of the people to the death of a loved one. So what were some of the things that people reported in the surveys that I've done? You know, were things such as economic risk, health care issues, mental health risk, and then after the inauguration, numbers that stayed pretty comparable. And again, here's the Clinton supporters. Here are the Johnson, Stein, um, Teddy Roosevelt voters over here, you know, the people who voted for everybody else. And what do I see is the way that this is being activated? Because, you know, for me as a hate crimes researcher, you know, what I'm looking at is we are seeing the collectivist attribution, which is always your tip off to stereotype. You know, the blue states believe this, the Hillary supporters believe this, the Bernie supporters believe this. Amplifying factors, be it media, be it alcohol, be it social permission giving. And you know, to me, this is one of the great risks we're running right now, 
is the kind of very soft response or the coded response that we're hearing to things such as Charlottesville, which where I sit is I'm thinking, I know folks who are going to hear that and are going to say, see, it can't be that bad, you know? I mean, see, here's what I would tell you. The way I look at it, this is an opinion, but it's an opinion based upon what I've worked with. About 10 years ago, I did a homicide case where a young man murdered his peer, another young man who was his neighbor for years. The young man who was murdered was an Asian man. The young man who did the offense was a white man. The, the, the defense for this said, well, the offender suffered a nervous and mental disorder, which he might have, where he only thought it was wrong to murder white people. So that was their defense strategy, really kind of intriguing. I know it's morally wrong to kill white people, but folks of color, it's okay. And what this fellow said when he was on the witness stand was, killing Asians is something I know my country doesn't really care about. It's okay. And that was part of his presentation. I leave it to you, but the challenge I see we're facing is the permission giving of saying, well, there are some honorable people in violent alt-right groups activate something that maybe 10 years ago we said was psychopathology. Now we say is maybe a culturally based presumption. So, you know, I think this plays at an extreme level of violence, but also plays again at what is happening to us societally is this loss of family. Again, you know, people who, I know there's a lot of students here who are not from Vermont. Do I go back to a red state? Do I relate with my uncle? Do I relate with my brother who's espousing these kinds of beliefs? Do I lose the connectivity through social media? Am I politically shamed? And you know, literally like the Thomas Wolfe novel, you know, maybe you cannot go home again. Let me move on here. Now, I'll say this really in passing. As people are more in opposition to human rights laws, hate crime laws, the rights of women in the workplace. The way that they approach this is what we call, and French and Raven would call, hard tactics. You pay, you buy, you withhold, you coerce, you shame. You may use legitimate power. And if you are an advocate for diversity, and this is based upon studies both that I've conducted with my colleagues in Spain, in Sacramento, California, in Los Angeles. There's a very different approach, and the approach is one of education and information, of saying that you have balanced relationships, of saying that you're doing this based upon your relationship, of I'm going to try and change your attitude with hate crime laws to support them. I do this trying to use knowledge in personal relationships. If I'm in opposition, I threaten you, I force you, and I try to get you to agree with me out of that sense of control. Now, the dilemma I think we're facing, and we have now these anti-fasci groups which are doing violence too, is they're now adopting the strategies of the alt-right and the neo-Nazis. And I find it very seductive, but I also think of it as inherently really flawed because we are then saying the way to change public opinion and social attitudes is through threat. And I don't think that that holds any long-term solution to anything. OK. So in the last couple of minutes, and I love this quote, I am the one who swims against the current, or as a contemporary medieval scholar says, I will make no bargains with monstrosity, referring to the Trump administration. Um, I'd like to leave you really with just one sort of thought piece, and this is for you to consider in your own circumstance. Over the years, I've seen individuals who have endured in situations of oppression. And really a wonderful psychiatrist who's now emeritus at Harvard, Chester Pierce, says, you know you're being oppressed when people are controlling your space, your time, your energy and your movement. He calls it STEM, space, time, energy, movement. You know you're being oppressed when those are being controlled. Give you some examples. 
When I was going to school in New Hampshire, I had a Russian professor named Benjamin. And long story kind of made short, Ben was a 13th century Crimean history scholar who was sent to the gulag because his work had no reflection of Soviet principles of social realism. And he spent a couple of years in solitary confinement. And I was an undergrad and quite, you know, kind of confused about that. And I said, Ben, and this guy looked like he was at a central casting, it's like a classic, like, you know, sort of central European academic, you know, with the coat and the pipe and the whole drill. And I said, how did you survive? He says, I learned to meditate and pray. And I was going, wow. Because you would never think. He was not like, you know, he didn't look like the Dalai Lama or anything, right? Um, and he survived that way. And ultimately, intriguingly, was only released from the Gulag when they realized he was actually a Polish Jew. And the Soviets said, you're not even worth our spending our money on. You're just kicked out of the country. But Ben survived by going internally and finding his own sense of sanity. The White Rose Movement. This is, again, something we seem almost completely to have forgotten about. At the height of the Second World War, students in Munich, imagine the bravery of this, started with their own printing press to produce leaflets. They handed out in Munich saying, we are in opposition to the Nazis. The Nazis do not speak for classic German, and they cited literature and culture. These are not really Germans. Good Germans are not these monsters. Now, almost all of the White Rose movement were, in a matter of a few months, apprehended and quickly killed. There were one or two that escaped. There was one that was alive and living in Portland, Oregon, is up to about 10 years ago. So here we have almost like the idea of like the children's crusade of literally in the belly of the beast, 1943-44, advocating publicly against the regime. At the same time in the same city, actually, Carl Hartman, one of the great symphonists of the century, went into silence. And his response was, I will no longer have my works published. I will no longer have my works performed. I will no longer engage in anything about music. And he just completely went silent. And his response was, my way of dealing with monstrosity was simply to no longer be in that world. Not too far from here, there was a man named Father James Whitaker, who was one of the first generation born American shakers, who prototypical religious hate crime was almost beaten to death in Massachusetts. And if you know about the Shakers, the Shakers were these people that like wrote like 10,000 American folk songs. Not only they make those groovy looking rocking chairs and those funny little baskets, they just everybody wrote songs, right? Because that's what you got to do if you're a Shaker. So Father James basically starts to have this beautiful song he writes, literally as they're picking him up off the sidewalk, if you will, out of the dirt that is one of the great Shaker songs, which is a song of just sort of the idea of mourning violence being done because of people's faith. There's a man I'll call John, the Mad Dog. He had a really interesting observation. He was a faculty person. And he was teaching maybe history, sociology, I forget now, during the People's Revolution in China. And I knew him when he was uh, teaching in New York City years later. And he said, with some, with some shame, that I survived by becoming a mad dog. And I said, well, what, is, what does that mean? He goes, I became more radical than the radicals. He says, the only way I found to survive was to espouse more extremist ideas. And that way, they left you alone, that maybe Carl Hartman's silence would have been seen as suspect. So he says, how did I survive? I said things that sounded so extremist that no one bothered me. And again, he had his own feeling about this. But for him, that was part of his, how do you get through a time of great challenge? Now, have any of you ever heard of who's called Good Soldier Schweik? This is one of my favorites. Okay. Good Soldier Schweik was basically a mythical character that described the resistance of the Czech culture to the Habsburg Empire. And what the idea was, if you were a good Czech who was being oppressed by the Austrians, everything you did in your day job, you did wrong. 
So if you're supposed to send the parcel to Salzburg, you send it to Budapest. If you're supposed to be docu documenting something in triplicate, you document it in 30 copies and then you send it to the wrong department. So good soldier swipe became like a folk hero for the Czechs of saying, you know, the way we survive this militaristic imperial world is we do everything wrong as a form of passive resistance and became sort of like this heroic image in the period during the First World War. I then argue we also have what I call the ghost of the machine. And you know, uh, Congressman John Lewis, who I once had the opportunity to actually talk to about hate crimes, um, is a wonderful example of somebody who comes from the Selma march through to today and was, of course, the first person who really called into question the legitimacy of the Trump administration. So we have these people that are like our survivors and that are advocates that remain around. Finally, one of my former students who was very severely gay bashed, Aaron, Aaron McLaughlin, and who's written about this, and you can find some of her writings online, um, thumbnail representation because Aaron could have been you. Aaron really could have been you because similarly, she was living in a liberal part of Los Angeles, an LGBT friendly community. She, I don't know what she was doing, she was a student doing this, but she was walking out of a bar of all things. She's walking out during probably late afternoon with her girlfriend and she sees a group of young men coming towards her and her first thought was this is dangerous and then her second thought was no, no, I know about diversity, don't stereotype don't think that they're all going to harm us. And of course, then these, these boys, maybe as many as 10, severely beat her and her girlfriend up. Her girlfriend's concussed. Erin said to me a year or so later when I got to know her, she says, I started to crawl out in the street so they'd stop kicking me and beating me. And if a car ran me over, at least it's all over. And actually, her experience was somebody slowed down and said, what are they doing to you? And then they saw and they, they drove off. So. Erin's experience was that she became an advocate and we have trained now 20 years now uh, around these issues of hate violence and intriguingly for her, just to give you again the complexity of these things, is the law enforcement responded very slowly to the case. The offenders stayed around the front of the lesbian bar where she um, was taken back into, literally mocking everyone in the bar and then they finally dispersed. The police show up, they don't charge it as a hate crime. They charge it as an attempt to rob them of cigarettes, of all things. Her girlfriend was undocumented and concussed, which meant that they didn't go to the emergency room because of a concern of being deported. And what Erin did out of this was, in part, got a job in the bar so that she could overcome her own trauma of wanting to avoid the situation. And then from there, and this is, again, I think really important because it talks about our experience. Here she was born and raised in uh, Southern California, came from a college-educated family, and when I had her in a class with me, I said, so what's this thing that happened to you that the students keep saying, well, this thing that happened to Erin? And she described it to me. I said, well, Erin, that's a hate crime, you know? And she goes, well, I really don't know what a hate crime is. What she did know was she was targeted because of her sexual orientation, being out in a gay community, and she also knew that she was very afraid for her, for her girlfriend who was undocumented. That started her journey of now being an advocate and working with not only LGB people, but also people with disabilities who are discriminated against. And it became for her and has become a long-standing process of change. So we're not alone. And, and the last person, and I guess maybe rightfully in some ways, was a a former member of the Mexican Mafia who I knew was a teenager who was about 17 years old when I knew him named Mikey. And Mikey would describe himself proudly as a cholo, as a real classically garbed, dressed out gang member. The bandana, the jeans, the white t-shirt, he looked like central casting, kind of like, you know, violent offender. And I've always remembered Mikey because he did something really interesting, which was he would say, over and over and over, he'd say, stop the hate. So a term that people have spent a lot of time getting focus group data and advertising to raise money over the last 20, 30 years, he was saying this just spontaneously. His point became this. He saw 
brown on brown violence is self-defeating and he became literally his own advocate and this is before like in my community we even had any kind of gang interdiction at all to speak of it's just you, you you know lock people up and he was mediating between different factions of the mexican mafia to get them to stop he even befriended it was quite intriguingly the program i worked with him he befriended a young african-american guy and said you know what we're doing to you guys are no better than what we're doing to each other. And his whole point was stop the hate. And so Mikey took this on himself as sort of an advocacy and became really, you know, he turned. He turned from choosing violence to choosing nonviolence. And the sad piece of this, of course, is that he was murdered when he was still a, a young man because of his advocacy against violence. So I think it's best to leave it with what he was saying is just that thought, is we're all left with our own challenge of how to stop the hate. And I appreciate your being here because you could easily have been someplace else. This is not a pleasant thing to talk about. It's not a pleasant thing to feel about. But for some of us here, I know it's our work. And as somebody once said, you never work alone. So these are the people I draw upon. All of us have our heroes, our heroines. All of us have to remember we're part of the tradition. The tradition's not going to go away no matter the conditions we're living under. Thank you for being here. Thank you. So um, thanks for sticking around. If you have some questions, I think Sherwood, we have a little bit of time to talk. Yeah, OK, OK. Questions about anything I have or have not said, please. Hi, up at the back. Yes. Hey there. I'll try. You know, with sort of um, domestic terrorism and stuff, is the debate on um, gun violence, like guns. And so we sort of know. I work in mental health, so obviously access to needs increases violence and stuff like that. But I was always like, well, you know, these guys are probably going to perpetrate it any way. They'll find a way or some, some way. Um, it's not the only factor. But one of the interesting things that you brought up, and I wanted, is when you did the sort of the um, you know the lay file, mm, and the four types, if you will. Mm, yeah. Right, and so I would imagine the planful, um, planful, uh, premeditated, premeditated. That I, I would imagine that that's um, a significantly lower number of people, and it's planful, and so. The likelihood, like, yeah, of course, if they have guns, it's going to be easier for them to do it. But And they're likely to be the people that would probably do it anyway. But it sounds like the high percentage of that violence that would occur, hate violence, would be from the sort of, like, highly aroused, high, like, the offender that's not going to be as planful. So I wonder if there's a lot of data or statistical data that's stating that basically the connection between guns and the access to guns and that type of crime, the crime we mostly Okay. To kind of paraphrase that, so what's the role of, no, no, good, yeah. What's the role of, of the use of a weapon for one thing and really the idea of premeditation and when we look at hate and premeditation. Okay, off of the research I've done, the more premeditated you are, the more biased you are, the more premeditated you are, the further you move out of your community. But I'll sort of reference something else. Um, it's intriguing. I've worked with a guy named Harry Kropp in Florida and we have profiled bias-motivated homicide offenders. And we've published a little bit on this. We're right now doing sort of some follow-up work. Intriguingly, a lot of the people that do bias-motivated homicides are doing hands-on, not even weapons, not even guns, but rather hands-on violence. And it is the idea of this immediacy of engaging violently against your victim that we're seeing. Okay, and we've got about 70 cases that we would classify as these are bias-motivated homicide offenders. All that Harry does is nothing but look at people that do um, um, homicides and violent crimes in the state of Florida. So we've got this, this population, really intriguing group. The other intriguing thing, though, about people that do murders where there's hate is the very, very high frequency of childhood violent abuse done to them prior to becoming adults and doing um, bias-motivated homicides. So, and I can add when I had looked at about 200 of the criminal histories of hate crime offenders who were arrested in the LAPD, when you go back, the first thing that shows up 
in their criminal record, and this is you know an artifact of the state of California, is to show that they were in homes where they were abused themselves. So. I'm not convinced that bias is the whole story at all with these kinds of dangerous individuals that do these unique and bizarre infractions, but I, I would suggest that one of the things is the idea that bias occurs with the idea that violence is naturally how you solve your problems. And when I talk about the bias homicide offenders and their histories, they were horrifying childhood experiences. I'm not talking I was knocked around by my old man, I'm talking about I was ritualistically abused. I was the victim of chronic, you know, incest. I was chained and left in, you know, the, the basement when my family was, just things that would make you just feel awful. So we see this in people that then become, in their own right as adults, engaging in hands-on violence. Not just carjacking, shooting you from across the street, but where I am proximal and enjoying that experience of that kind of violence. And so again, these very rare individuals have their own kind of stories behind it. Other questions, comments, please? Hi, right here, yes, hi. Yeah, how does poverty play a role? Um, boy, uh, it plays some role. I would, I would argue on two levels. See, I've known hate crime offenders and I've worked with hate crime offenders who were uh, highly skilled professionals, highly degreed individuals. So I'm clearly seeing people who are very successful professionals who engage in hate crime activity. That being said, as with any criminalized activity, when you look at gangs, you see poverty, the absence of economic resources, the absence of internal resources of education, of stable families and domestic environments, and clearly that that's a factor that both creates the risk, and, and very importantly here, creates the risk of recurring hate crime activity. And you know, put it this way, this is the same with anybody that belongs to a criminal gang. What happens if I get the person to leave the criminal gang? What are they entering into? Not just a hate gang, any criminal gang. If you're going to say, you should really get out of the Mexican Mafia, you should get out of the Peckerwood Gang, you should get out of the Aryan Nation, the challenge becomes, do I have anything to belong to? And if what we're saying societally or institutionally is you're on your own, then of course these people come back to these groups. Now, having said that, I'll ask, uh, answer a question that wasn't per se really asked, but which is this. Do you incarcerate a hate crime offender as a way to fix the problem? Okay, the great dilemma is if you have been convicted of a hate crime and you are incarcerated, guess what happens when you're institutionalized? Everyone's gonna find out what you're there for. Anyone who's not of your racial group, in some cases religious group or ethnic group, holds you with greater animus. The one group that will support you is the group that you're a part of. So if you come in as impoverished and hate-oriented, you're protected by that group, you were radicalized by that group, and if you're released, what else do you have except the group to go back to? give you a quick story, and this is all public record so I can say it. I remember looking at a case with the uh, DA's office in Los Angeles, and there was a young man named Randy Rojas, Latino last name, who was raised in a multi-ethnic household, and he exclusively perpetrated violence against Latinos. And when they investigated him, the FBI said, what are you doing this for? He goes, I believe in white power. I'm down for white power. Now, Randy lived in an extremely poor community, had not graduated high school, had a meth problem, belonged to a white power gang, lived in one of the poorest parts of the Los Angeles County area called the High Desert Area. A lot of meth labs and a lot of poverty and a lot of unemployment. And intriguingly, here's where we get into the demographics. A part of Los Angeles where we call it the white flight idea of the 1960s, the whites moved out of the inner city, went to the high desert. The 1990s, Latinos move into the black communities that have been white, the blacks move to the high desert. The whites who left the blacks are now infuriated that the blacks have now left the Latinos to move outward, and then these become the gangs and the forms of aggression we see. Randy 
was incarcerated for beating up Latino kids, set him down for white power, becomes a hero in prison, is released after a few years. When I saw this case, I thought, this is trouble. He's released. And now get into the mindset. You're going out on a date with your girlfriend on a Saturday night. She's a part of the gang, too. And you see a black homeless man, you beat him to death, because what else you got to do? And now Randy's incarcerated again. He's going to be there for life, we hope. He's a hero in prison. So, you know, if somebody says to me, what's the primary issue? I would look at, can they get a job? Can they have a romantic attachment? Can they finish any kind of an educational trade experience? Do they have a drug problem? And if we address those things, maybe their bias becomes something you address down the road a piece. But I don't start with the bias. I would start with the idea of poverty, vulnerability, impulse disturbance, drug problems. And again, if you take a person out of a gang and the gang is all that they have, you know, if you were asked to give up everything that you have as your collective and your social support, that's the challenge. What are we giving as an alternative? And that's the hard part. That's the hard part is, as Rafe Ezekiel put it, finding an alternative ideology you can live with. Other comments or questions, please? Way up at the back. Hi there. So what we're seeing across the nation is recruitment of uh, you know, outright white supremacist recruitment on college campuses. Um, that tend to target specific, sometimes specific segment of the white uh, population. And very uh, stealth and very sophisticated in terms of recruitment. Um, and it, it, it skirts violence, at least not yet, as it met the threshold for Johnson. violence. Right. But, but it skirts on the periphery that could escalate any time. Um, and so the challenge is how do you identify uh, ki uh, kids who are at risk uh, because they become, in, in many respects, uh, perpetrators and victims, right? So how do you identify kids who are at risk of recruitment and intervene in ways that pulls them in uh, rather than, than leave them in prey because they are sometimes kids who are isolated, kids who are on the spectrum, kids who are a particular set of kids that are being recruited. So I, so I wonder what you offer in terms of engaging. The point, in part, just to paraphrase, is how do we look at this idea of recruitment into biased ideology groups, alt-right at this point in time, that are happening in our campuses? And not only how do we understand what the risks are of that process, but yes, indeed, who are the people that are vulnerable to join these groups? And this gets to the other side of the idea of poverty, but it's whether people that are able to go to a university are still solicited, you know, quite, quite seriously, are solicited. And it wasn't that long ago we would say, well, you know, these are just people out there doing something in a very unsystematic fashion. You know, the people opening up a website that has like 10 followers. Now we're seeing these as very well-funded, well-executed strategies to draw people into these ideological groups. Again, there's a cultural challenge we're facing, because if we were right now in, France or parts of Europe or parts of Latin America, they would say we see those as terrorist groups. And what they would say is we're not going to wait for the violence to follow. What they're espousing we treat as a threat societally. And we say, well, it's a First Amendment right. And to make the point in a different way of this idea of solicitation, Right now, if you look at neo-Nazi groups in Central Europe, Germany, Austria, the Czech Republic, Hungary, you see something really intriguing. Their primary icon for these hate groups is Che Guevara. If you look at some of the photographs, and there's a criminologist I work with in, in Berlin, and he says, I got photos of these groups. You would think you were at a 
reggae or a world music con concert because they're dressed out not in neo-Nazi garb at all, but they look like they are going to a Coachella music festival where I live, right? They look like they are suddenly extremely contemporary. They solicit women into the movement with the awareness of then being able to draw more and more young men into these groups. So yes, these are not people that are randomly showing up and doing these things. There's a lot of planning behind this. And of course, that's one of our challenges. Now, in our culture, when we look at this idea of First Amendment right and free speech and balanced opinion, it's intriguing. People of my age are more tolerant of that. But according to survey research, when you look at university students, they are much more ready to say, I want you to stop those folks from being on campus. Students are much more likely than people over the age of 40 of saying, I don't want you know, an alt-right speaker on my campus. I don't want somebody who's going to create that divisiveness. And you know, this kind of flies in the face of some of our ideas of liberal democratic tradition. So you know, we're looking at a real kind of generational challenge of beliefs in this country. And how do we create a better alternative for these people is very, very challenging. And you know, if I may add this, the people I know who have desisted from hate groups, I mean people that are really like the organizers, it's intriguing. They don't have much of an answer for why they got out. And I, I'd say this amongst us, it's a little bit like talking to a dry drunk. Why did you stop drinking? You know, well, I just stopped drinking. Do you have any understanding of it? No, I just stopped drinking. Why did you stop belonging to a violent uh, hate group? Oh, I just decided to stop belonging. I mean, a few of them will say things like, I realized it was too close to home. There's one guy in Los Angeles who says, my mom has cerebral palsy, and the group was saying, after we got rid of the Latinos and the immigrants, then we're going to get rid of the people with disabilities. And that like turned his lights on. But often people desist from these groups with the vaguest of their own knowledge as to why. So we're really kind of grappling with, how do people come out? And I think it is about identity. And I think it is about having an alternative place to compel people to belong to. Um, and some of the social psychology research says, you know, you can turn prejudices on and off and stereotypes on and off. And I think that's what we've got to look at is how do we turn off beliefs in things which are extremist and give a person a place at the table where they feel like there's something they can be instead. And I'm concerned we're kind of losing that battle to the alt-right, into these you know, well-planned uh, recruitment strategies we see around the globe. Um, so it's a very much a real problem. And again, it's a generational difference. Younger folks are much re more ready to say, I don't want that on my campus, please, than those of us who are teaching and, and working there. So it's a partial answer, but you see it's a very big challenge we're looking at many, many places. Other comments, questions, anybody, please? OK. Sherwood, thank you, and thank you. Have a good night. <laughs>